to CSWE's Leading Critical Conversations video series. My name is Mia Moreno-Hines. I am the CSWE production editor, and today we are going to feature conversations about the impact of COVID-19 on social work programs. The Journal of Social Work Education published a special supplemental issue with 19 articles available to the public that address how the pandemic has affected accredited programs, faculty, students, and higher education in general. I'm excited to welcome Dr. Daniel Parrish, professor at Baylor University's Diana R. Garland School of Social Work and editor-in-chief of JSWE to talk more about this special issue. We're also joined by associate editors of the journal who helped to bring the special issue together. Dr. Nalini Negi, who is an associate professor at the School of Social Work at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, and Dr. Christina Mogro-Wilson, an Associate Prof Professor and Research Director at the Yukon Health University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Thank you for joining us, Danielle, Nalini, and Christina. To kick off the conversation, can you please tell our viewers a little about yourselves and your roles as co-editors for the special issue? Sure, um, I'm Danielle Parrish, and, and as you mentioned, I'm a professor at uh, Baylor University. And uh, my research scholarship and teaching focus on bridging the research practice gap for historically underserved populations by developing and testing efficient technology infused interventions that improve health and mental health and that can be adopted more easily in real practice settings. And my teaching um, has focused uh, primarily on teaching students to become critical consumers of practice research and skilled evaluators of their practice and to use these skills to inform uh, practice decisions. In terms of this special issue, I was uh, really grateful to have my co-editors join me. Um, this was a huge undertaking, but one that we found to be very important and that we thought would benefit um, social work educators now and in the future. Christina? Sure. Hi, I'm Christina Mogro wilson I, as Mia mentioned, am an associate professor and the Puerto Rican and Latino Studies Project at the UConn University of Connecticut School of Social Work and a research director at the UConn Health University Center in Developmental Disabilities. I am a Latina scholar and expert in health disparities and cultural humility and working with Latino families. So my interest is around improving the lives of Latino families, uh, looking at parenting and how culture influences parenting and my most recent work focuses on Latino dads and how fatherhood um, impacts their lives, particularly during times um, of great stress and uncertainty. As far as this special issue, it's just been a real joy to see this come together, um, particularly um, during a difficult time for everybody and to see the amount of interest around um, publishing and putting out information about how all of our schools across the country have coped with the pandemics. It was a pleasure working with Dr. Parrish and Dr. Morgan Wilson on this special issue. Uh, as Dr. Morgan Wilson stated, it's been a really difficult time for many and it's been a really uh, point of pride for us to lead this special issue because it brings together learned knowledge and experience and research from different schools of social work about the different types of innovations implemented during a time of pandemic. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us why was it important to focus a special issue on COVID-19? So I would say um, it, be, it quickly became apparent early on that this pandemic was um, disrupting life as we knew it for just about everybody, um, you know, within social work education and beyond. <laughs> um, the last similar experience that I think we've, um, as a society, have uh, experienced was the 1918 influenza pandemic. And that was that happened during a time uh, when the social work profession was still emerging and um, before even the establishment of what would then become the Council on Social Work Education. And so while understandably there was not much published about the role of social work education during that pandemic, we wanted to create a way to document and learn 
from the experiences um, that uh, social work educators, students, and, and administrators were going through so that we could learn from this and um, disseminate some of the, the innovations that Dr. Negi was mentioning um, for future academic disruptions, as well as um, the current pandemic that continues to um, go on and future pandemic. What was the criteria for submitting manuscripts and what kind of manuscripts did you receive? For example, conceptual, theoretical? So we accepted manuscripts that were typical uh, types of manuscripts that we would accept um, through JSWE. So conceptual, theoretical pieces, qualitative studies, quantitative studies, teaching field, uh, research notes. Our hope was to gather research and important lessons learned from navigating the pandemic during uh, COVID-19 uh, with implications for future educational disruptions due to pandemic or natural disasters, as well as strategies and models uh, that were innovative that could consider continue to serve us well past the conclusion of the pandemic. Did you find any of this research surprising? Yeah, I'll jump in. I thought, um, you know, we received so many really wonderful submissions. And I think it was really encouraging to see so many articles that really focused um, and used a trauma informed framework. I think we often see the trauma informed framework being utilized in social work practice um, in our clinical work. However, um, that we're seeing a lot of we were seeing a lot of submissions and articles submitted using a trauma informed network, but applied to teaching, applied to administrative work, field education, supervision, student issues, um, and so kind of that that was really interesting and and a wonderful use of kind of our theoretical frameworks and models being applied to kind of our higher education. Yeah, and. Uh, my surprise, although uh, I shouldn't be that surprised because I know schools of social work, like social workers, are so resilient, was the incredible work that uh, schools of social work engaged in in a time of crisis, like Dr. Parrish was indicating. Uh, people uh, conducted surveys to re really have an understanding of the pulse of what was going on. And some of the findings I think are really illuminating and hopefully should set our path, path forward in terms of the future. Uh, some of the, the studies that are reported in the special issue uh, include a survey of faculty to assess what the different types of workload have been on faculty in terms of teaching and field. And the survey indicates uh, that actually it has gone up and it's disproportionately impacted non tenure track faculty who tend to be people of color and women. So these are important directions that we really need to be thinking through in terms of schools of social work moving forward. I think an, another area that jumped out to me was uh, although also not particularly surprising was the uh, ways in which uh, schools of social work adapted uh, to using technology more widely um, in some of the innovative ways that they did that. And I think through this pandemic, we learned that this is not, you know, if you were a late adopter to technology, you had to sort of jump in and it was trial by fire, right? But, you know, I think that we learned some really important things about this where, you know, for example, maybe we were hesitant about telehealth as a field. Uh, we're not quite sure about that, but we, we have uh, learned, yeah, I think, through some of the articles in the special issue and, and other research as well, that um, this was uh, well utilized um, by many uh, clients and um, practitioners. And so there was a study um, by Canada Eastern Banks that showed that um, through using telehealth through a student clinic, um, client sy symptoms were able to remain stable during the pandemic, which I think is kind of amazing. Um, and that the no-show and cancellation rates declined. And I, I thought that was pretty telling for the promise of telehealth moving forward. And I'm kind of wondering how that will look in field placements moving forward, if that will be something that we think about um, providing additional training for students for not only in field, but maybe also in the curriculum. 
Yeah. And some really excellent strategies uh, and practices that work really well for different schools include the process of termination, which right. can be brought during any sort of time and challenging, but during a time of pandemic and remote can be even more challenging. Uh, other sort of strategies that are uh, included are, as Dr. Parrish indicated, how do you even conceptualize the syllabus when you're in the middle of a, a situation that you, that is unpredictable, right? Like the pandemic is. Uh, how do you think through uh, your students' well-being as you are te teaching? So some really uh, great strategies and tips and recommendations that have worked well for uh, faculty are included in this special issue. I, I wanted to add to this that I was really happy to see and, and to have at, at sort of the end of our special issue, a few pieces that um, paid attention to the twin pandemics of racial discrimination and COVID-19 um, and uh, the many other ways that racial, ethnic and economic inequality embedded in our society had really amplified um, the disparities in our society. And um, so I'm, I'm excited that there were some um, real concrete recommendations um, that were made by a couple of our authors on how to move forward within schools of social work um, in more just ways and uh, with ideas to address unjust structural factors that we have in our own academy. Yeah, in particular, Delmar Farinha, uh, they all propose using the critical uh, race theory to minimize the impact of structural oppression and really uh, boost the well being of particularly Black, Indigenous, people of color students. As well as there's other important theory and conceptualizations of how we can really deal with the, like as Dr. Parrish indicated, the twin pandemic of, uh, you know, racism, systemic racism, as well as the health pandemic that we're experiencing. Yeah, I thought, you know, overall, like kind of encompassing the amount of articles that we had, we are showing a real like sense of resilience in, in student higher education that we're coming up with some really innovative solutions um, uh, thinking on the ground. I mean, this is a tough time, not only because we had to move online, but we are like socially isolated. We were, um, a lot of us fu functioning without our networks um, of support um, and very, and for many people, very, very isolated. But I think this sense of resiliency that higher education, we can come together, we can provide suggestions um, and come away with lessons learned, um, shows some great strengths. But at the same time, as both of you had mentioned, um, I think some of these articles really highlight some of our weaknesses and challenges, um, but also opportunities where our schools can become stronger, better ways is to support um, our students, our most marginalized students, um, better ways to support parenting and caregiving families um, in a way that's never really been exposed to us before. These you know, groups obviously have always existed, but now this, pa these pandemics really highlighted um, some of the struggles they were experiencing. So I think you know, social work has always been committed to marginalized populations, but now our marginalized populations within institutes of edu higher education have really um, kind of, this has opened up um, our vulnerabilities. And so we have a lot of work to do, but I think we have, you know, we are showing the capacity and the resilience to be able to do that work. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, there were more than 90 submissions for the special issue. Were you surprised by that? And how do you choose uh, which one to include in the section? So honestly, I was worried at first that we would not get enough submissions for the special issue. Um, so, you know, my thought was that everybody was so occupied with the pandemic and the stress of that, that, um, yeah, they just, that few people would have time to write about it. So, you know, part of me was pleasantly surprised to see that there was so much interest in the special issue. Um, but then, you know, when you get 
90 submissions, that, that makes the process much more difficult, um, you know, when you're trying to select the very best papers from a lot of really excellent papers um, that were submitted. So um, basically the process we went through um, was to have all the papers go out for peer review. Um, and so, you know, thank you to um, Ms. Marino, uh, Mia Marino Hines for, you um, securing all of those reviewers in this process. I know that took a lot of time um, and effort um, and, and uh, looked at those reviews and um, considered um, you know, the content areas that were covered. We wanted to make sure that we had um, representation across various, various areas of interest in social work education, including field, um, teaching, um, administration and, and some of the important issues that um, we thought our readers could learn from uh, in terms of the pandemic. And so um, there, you know, while there were many manuscripts that uh, we wished we could uh, accept um, that didn't make it into the final issue, but we hope that um, those authors are pushing those papers forward in, into other uh, social work education journals. And we're grateful to all the authors for the time that they took, um, uh, you know, applying uh, for the special issue. Yeah, we were extremely surprised, um, as Danielle said, um, but also really amazed by the response of the social work community, really showing there's this hunger and need for this knowledge um, to hear about how other programs and other groups and other universities are really coping during this time. And so that um, we're really hoping that this information will really help um, because it sounds like the community wants to hear great solutions and how other other universities are struggling, uh, what we're doing in our with our students, uh, faculty and staff. So we're hoping it'll bring a place, a voice uh, for us to learn and share what we're experiencing. And yeah, it was very difficult making decisions, um, but really wanted to cover certain areas. So we wanted to make sure that the special issue is divided into sections uh, around teaching, uh, field education, student issues, um, uh, challenges in administration, and then a refocus to social justice during this time. So um, we wanted- And what do you hope JSW readers will gain from these articles and special issue? I know you covered that a little bit, but if you could speak on that some more. Of course, when we started this special issue, I, I was hoping the pandemic would be far behind us by the time the issue was published. And so given it's not, and we still have many COVID-19 cases, information continues to be relevant. And so um, hopefully it will be helpful, you know, now that it's out and published to uh, current faculty and students. And uh, as Dr. Parrish indicated earlier, we had talked about uh, telehealth for a long time, right? We would have it in sections, small sections of books, but it wasn't implemented at such a large scale as we are doing now. We had talked about online uh, education and best strategies of, you know, online school, you know, social work programs, social work classes, but not implemented at such a grand sort of scale as we've implemented now. So these are some of the ways and thinking that we can implement moving forward too. Do we need to have um, three hour continuous lectures in person or can we have online modalities and then some in-person discussion? I mean, paradigm shifting sort of models have really come out of this time because we've had to break the paradigm of ways of thinking about social work education. Yeah, and I think, you know, this special issue will really start just opening up more conversation around these that are, you know, cro across country, across um, different, you know, different groups within our social work community. I think, you know, now we are more isolated, continue to be isolated um, from one another. Um, our, you know, conference last year was virtual. Um, you know, those kind of things have kind of interrupted our dialogue and, and the movement of knowledge forward. And so I hope that the journal of social education can be 
kind of a leading way to continue to keep these dialogues continuous, uh, keep people collaborating, um, and to as a way to kind of express the great and wonderful ideas that people are implementing and using. Could you tell me any of your final thoughts on it? So I'd like to start by um, thanking the many authors that submitted 90 manuscripts and then the 180 plus reviewers that took um, time during a very difficult time to uh, review the, all of these manuscripts and provide excellent feedback. Um, and also grateful to you, uh, Mia, for all of your hard work um, in managing the 90 manuscripts as they went through the review process. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Parrish for uh, really coming in with very uh, innovative ideas about different sort of special issues as she's come into the editor-in-chief world during a really difficult time. So I wanna thank her and I wanna thank her also for inviting myself and Dr. Mugler Wilson to this special issue. I'd like to thank Dr. Mugler Wilson for being a wonderful person to work with as well. And so wonderful that I think we're gonna be working again together, correct? Yes, um, thank you, um, Dr. Parrish and Dr. Negi. It's been an amazing experience to be able to collaborate on this um, and you know, keeping me out of isolation a little bit, meeting with all of you via Zoom regularly on this special issue. We um, really you know, thought the kind of missing piece in the conversation at the end of all this was how kind of academic mothers of young children are coping during the pandemics. And we have so many caregivers among us that have really had to balance multiple demands from young children at home, and this created a lot of disparities. And so Dr. Parrish was really interested in this idea and asked Dr. Nagy and I to kind of address this issue. We have gathered together an exceptional group of really strong and brilliant minds from across the country um, of academic mothers of young children to really talk about uh, their different identities and their different circumstances during the pandemics that, um, and, and how this really affected them and their lives, both professionally and personally. So we really want um, an article um, or a group of essays to come out talking about these issues um, but not only talking about the issues, but really thinking about some important recommendations uh, and systematic change for the academy. And so that's um, up, coming up next. I'm very excited to uh, look at that work. I'm so, you know, I'm hearing such wonderful things about it, and I'm so grateful that um, you are both taking that on and pushing that forward. I think it's going to make a huge contribution to um, our profession. Um, you know, it seems like we should be the first to be addressing those issues in social work. And unfortunately, we haven't been. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Parrish, Dr. Nagy, and Dr. Mogra Wilson for taking the time to meet with me and discuss the special issue on COVID. It's been a pleasure talking with you and working with you, and I look forward to our next chat and project. Thank it's you. A pleasure. Thank you, Mia.